Good afternoon. Welcome to the Lunch with Books live stream. I'm Sean Duffy, the host, and uh, I will introduce our guest for today in just a few minutes. I wanted to announce a couple of things first. Uh, next week on Election Day, November 3rd, we will uh, provide some uh, stress relief in the form of poetry when Erin Murphy joins us for the ongoing Wheeling Poetry Series. Uh, she is at Penn State Altoona and is a very fine poet, and Mark Harshman is the host of that, as usual. Uh, the week after that, uh, uh, sorry, the Saturday after that, we have the Upper Ohio Valley Festival of Books, and we'll be celebrating the memoir. We'll have uh, uh, Bobby Kahn will conduct a workshop for memoir writing. That workshop is now full. Um, to those of you who registered, congratulations, you got one of the 15 spots. And um, we're looking forward to that on November 7th, starting at 11 a.m. Our guest today has been with us before to talk about one of his other books. Ronald S. Coddington is an editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education and the editor and publisher of Military Images magazine. He is the author of Faces of the Confederacy, Faces of the Civil War, African American Faces of the Civil War and, the, and Faces of Civil War Navies. Today, he's here to tell you about his new book having to do with the nurses of the Civil War. Here is Ronald Connington. All right, Sean, uh, thank you so very much. And uh, to everyone at the library for the support and uh, for making this ongoing series possible. And also thanks to all of you um, for the opportunity to talk uh, today about uh, faces of Civil War nurses. And um, I've got a presentation I wanna take you through and uh, we'll look at um, uh, a little bit of a setup to talk about nurses uh, during the Civil War. We'll also take a look at photography during the Civil War, and then I'll introduce you to a few of the nurses who appear in the book. So let me share my screen. And uh, we'll get started. All right. Can everyone see? I take it that's a yes. Yes, we can see, Ron, go ahead. Okay, great. So here we go. Um, I thought that a really great place to start would be the woman who appears on the cover. And um, as you can see, she's dressed in um, uh, quite an outfit. She has a unique uh, uniform coat on, and uh, so I want to take a little closer look at her entire uh, uniform that she's wearing. She is, in fact, Marie uh, Leonard or Marie Tepe, also known or more popularly known as French Mary during the Civil War. She, in fact, was a vivandière, which is a French term uh, for women who basically attach themselves to a military organization. And in this case, Marie attached herself to the 114th Pennsylvania Infantry. And the uniform that she wears is something that mimics the same uniforms that were worn in France. These are unofficial uniforms, uh, sort of quasi-military, developed by the individuals, or I should say individualized, to meet a specific need. In this case, um, the one... 114th Pennsylvania was a Zouab unit, which means their uniforms were inspired by uh, French Algerian uniforms. And so she has a unique tunic that has a tombeau on the front. Um, you can see she's wearing a um, like a knee length dress. She has uh, a pair of trousers on, military boots, and a woman's bonnet. Uh, around her neck is strapped uh, a large uh, container, a cask that she would use to carry water in to help soldiers who needed a drink. And um, lastly, you can see a very large holster 
that uh, is attached to her belt slash sash. Now, she is someone who was on battlefields, not necessarily in harm's way, but there were occasions at Gettysburg, for example, where there's eyewitness accounts. Uh, the quote that I have here is on the battlefield of Fredericksburg when one of the officers told her to go to the back and um, she, in her very uh, aggressive way, said, well, she said to the officer, maybe I'm not so scared as you are. And then she laughed and made no sign of obedience, according to this note in the regimental history. And uh, shortly after that, so the story goes, she suffered a wound in her ankle. Now, Marie fits into a particular category uh, of nurses, of folks who practice caregiving and caretaking. Uh, I mentioned earlier that she is officially known as the Vandier, but there are other individuals who attach themselves to Civil War regiments. Sometimes they were called the mother of the regiment, the daughter of the regiment, and the way they would find themselves uh, attached to these regiments was often because of a husband, a boyfriend uh, who may have enlisted in the regiment as a soldier. They could have also uh, arrived with the regiment through local charity that was raising money to support the regiment. Uh, they could have also joined because perhaps a son had joined the regiment and he became sick and um, the mother went to help the son and then became semi-attached to the regiment. So these sort of uh, women that joined regiments in this way, I think of them as freelancers. And while they were certainly part of regiments during the Civil War, they make up a relatively small part. Now, the much larger group are paid and volunteer nurses. Uh, and in the book and elsewhere, I talk about them. I use different terms to describe who they are. Nurses, matrons, relief workers, caregivers, and they were prevalent throughout uh, the North and the South, but in different ways. Now, if we look at the Confederate States, there's really two major areas where you're going to see women serving in some form of nursing. It's gonna be the army or it's going to be through local and state charities. One of the significant challenges that uh, women had in the Southern states is the invading Union armies uh, and the lack of resources made it difficult for them to have uh, any sense of regularity. So they were fairly limited in the scope of what they could do. In the Union Army, the same uh, opportunities applied. You could join the Army, and when I say join the Army, I mean that you could join as a result of uh, a volunteer process. Uh, many of you, then you would eventually get paid, but you would submit an application. Uh, the well-known chief of Army nurses in Washington was Dorothea Dix. I'll talk about her later, but Dorothea Dix and her pioneering efforts formed one way for women to become involved. The other way, much like in the Confederate States, was through your local and state charities. Imagine in 1861, when the war begins, uh, you want to do your part to help. And so the local women in town might form an aid society to, to create supplies, uh, to raise money to support the troops. And that would also create a way for you to become involved. Now, in the North, uh, you've got another significant entry point to become involved, and that's through the U.S. Christian Commission. And um, the Christian Commission was a large and sprawling organization that uh, uh, reached out across the states and sent women uh, into uh, the South and into hospitals in both the South and the North 
to care for wounded and sick soldiers. Of course, they also brought with them, in addition to all of their caregiving skills, they also brought with them religion, uh, the hope that they could convert young men to uh, become Christians. There's also a very large secular organization, which is roughly the equivalent of the Christian Commission, if you want to think about it in those broad terms. The U.S. Sanitary Commission in the East and its um, uh, equivalent, the Western Sanitary Commission, those two organizations together were an amazingly large philanthropy. Uh, Again, secular, um, so they didn't quite have the same uh, Christian focus as the Christian Commission, but the U.S. Sanitary Commission raised huge money um, to support the soldiers in the field. And so when you see uh, the Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission, these large national philanthropies, you can imagine uh, how, um, how much spread and how much sprawl these organizations had to put women out there to help soldiers. And this is dramatically more powerful than the Southern states. And in fact, I would argue this is consistent with the same situation that the Union and Confederate armies faced. Um, The Southern armies were oftentimes hampered by the lack of supplies, the lack of resources, and the lack of manpower. Uh, The same is true on the nursing side of the equation. Now, another way to think about nurses Uh, during the war is through the uniforms. Uh, And I'm using the term uniform very loosely uh, in this situation uh, because there was was no no real such thing as a uniform. Um, There was no prescribed uniform per se. Uh, You have already met Marie, uh, the the Vandier, and I described her uniform to you. Those uh, uniforms were very customized. They were very personalized, depending upon which regiment you were in and the, uh, the way that woman wanted to portray herself. The next woman, the woman to Marie's uh, right, is uh, Helen Gilson. I'll talk a little bit more about her later. Um, but Helen Gilson wears what I might say is a little bit closer to the kind of uniform that Dorothea Dix would like to see the nurses wear. Um, Dorothea uh, believed in drab outfits. She didn't want anything that was um, attracting attention. Um, She didn't want a lot of bright colors. She did not want a lot of ornamentation. And so this uniform, uh, this outfit, this dress that Helen is wearing um, does not have a lot of ornamentation. And I can imagine that the colors were not particularly bright. The woman next to her is uh, Mary Morris' husband. I'll talk a little bit about her later. And um, she wears uh, a custom apron. Now, this is something of her own design. And you'll notice it's distinguished by two features. Uh, It has very large pockets in the front. In fact, one of her hands is placed inside of the pocket. And um, it's roomy. It's, it's, a, it's a loosely fitting apron, but then again, it's tight enough where it's not going to get caught up on things. The idea that nurses would make their own custom garments so that they could move through the wards of hospitals without, uh, with ease and having a functional garment was something that was not supplied by the Union or Confederate armies. It was on them to come up with Uh, whatever look that they wanted to have. Now, uh, the last woman is someone from uh, Wheeling, from your hometown. Uh, And um, you may have seen this image before. She is Sister Ignatius uh, Farley. And um, she wears the habit of a Catholic nun. She was part of the Catholic Church. And um, it's not uncommon for women uh, of all denominations to wear the customary clothing, the customary garb associated with their religion. So uh, Sister Farley is certainly a great example of that. Now, for American women who are getting involved 
in the Civil War, uh, I found very few direct references in my research by these women to Florence Nightingale, who is pictured here. But it seems impossible to me that these women would not be familiar with Florence Nightingale or her book, Notes on Nursing, What It Is and What It Is Not. This book came out in 1859, coincidentally, just a couple of years before the war. And uh, I love this quote, which sort of gives you the general sense of uh, what Florence Nightingale is all about. She says, every woman, or at least almost every woman in England has, at one time or another of her life, charge of the personal health of somebody, whether child or invalid. In other words, every woman is a nurse. She comes to um, uh, fame. She gets her notability uh, during the Crimean War, which involved her home country, 1853 to 1856. Uh, this is where her practical experiences serving in the army, attaching herself to the British forces, led her to write the book. And um, here's an image. I don't have an image of her uh, on the ground with soldiers, uh, but the next best thing is this Crimean War image of a Mrs. Rogers with Men of the Fourth Dragoons by the very well-known uh, photographer Roger Fenton. So to get back to this idea of how popular Florence Nightingale might have been in America, I did a survey uh, from the website newspapers.com and found between the years 1854 and 1865, which is roughly the uh, first first main year or the first full year of the Crimean War through the end of the Civil War, I found 7,174 newspaper mentions of Florence Nightingale. And you'll see uh, in the early part, those first years during the Crimean War, her fame gradually grows. Uh, and then it drops a little bit in 1857, 1858. When she writes her book, uh, when that comes out in 1859, you see uh, the height of her popularity, at least according to the newspaper mentions in all of the newspapers that are collected on newspapers.com, spikes in 1860. Uh, and 1861 is also a big year for mentions. So again, you're right on the cusp of the American Civil War when this book is landing. Now, uh, there's an American edition of this book that comes out in 1860. And in that American edition is a biographical sketch. And I think it's added to give readers who might not know of her Crimean War experience a little bit of a sense of who she is. And um, she makes, uh, there's a comment about here uh, that I think is appropriate to the nurse who might, or the American woman who might have been thinking ahead about Civil War nursing. Uh, and the quote is, surely if there was heroism in dashing up the heights of Alma, seeking glory at the cannon's mouth in defiance of death and of all mortal opposition, amid the shouts of victors and the cries of the vanquished, there was heroism unparalleled in calmly volunteering to minister to the fever-stricken and the dying. So, Florence Nightingale is basically saying here, nursing the contributions of women in war as nurses is equal to the heroism of a soldier on the battlefield. So here's where we get to the American side uh, of that equation. Here's uh, Georgie uh, Bacon, who is a, um, a New Yorker and she eventually becomes a nurse. And long after the war, she and her sister write uh, their collected memoirs based on their letters and diary entries during the war. And um, her quote here says, uh, no one knows who did not watch the thing from the beginning, how much opposition, how much ill will, how much unfeeling wants of thought these women nurses endured. Hardly a surgeon whom I can think of received or treated them with even common courtesy. So what Georgie is talking about here is the idea that 
once women nurses became attached to the army, they encountered, generally speaking, a hostile male-centered military who ultimately did not want them there. So folks like Georgie and her sister nurses are not one to take no for an answer. And so uh, the narrative of her, her, her narrative continues uh, and she's basically saying, she's describing the uh, doctors uh, and the doctors comments as mere annoyances. Um, she says, these annoyances could not have been endured by the nurses, but for the knowledge that they were pioneers. She's saying the women, of course, were pioneers who were, if possible, to gain standing ground for others who must create the position they wished to occupy. Now, this relation that Virgie and other women of that time period were pioneers and that they understood that the role that they were in was one that was going to require them to fight against the norms of the time is quite amazing. Um, it is also uh, very much tied to the spirit of Florence Nightingale. And if you want to go a little bit larger uh, that and look at the American uh, context, you've got all the reform movements of the 1830s, the 1840s, and the 1850s, where industrialization is changing. Women's role uh, in the workplace is beginning to change. Her role in the family is beginning to change. So you could argue that by extension, these women who decided to become nurses during the American Civil War were an extension of that spirit of reform and progress that was growing out of the earlier part of the 19th century. Here's another uh, quote from a woman you may very well know. This is Clara Barton, uh, arguably the most uh, notable and famous nurse to come out of the war. And um, she makes a similar argument to Florence Nightingale about the importance of the contribution of women behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, Clara Barton says, while they march on with tread of iron and plumes proudly tossing in the breeze, someone must follow closely in their steps, crouching to the earth, toiling in the rain and darkness, shelterless like themselves, with no thought of pride or glory, fame or praise or reward, hearts breaking with pity, faces bathed in tears and hands in blood. This is the side which history never shows. Now, one of the goals, when I read that, one of the goals of the book was really to tell the stories, those stories that history has largely forgotten. Having said that, uh, two women, the two women pictured here, Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix, I did not write specific profiles about their lives. And I did it for two reasons. One of them is you can go uh, and do a Google search right now uh, and find plenty of information about both of these individuals and their contributions. Uh, and so I thought, because there's so much out there, let's let some of the women whose voices have not been heard for the better part of 150 years, uh, give them a chance, let's tell their stories. That is to say that these women are certainly, uh, Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix, are certainly worthy of having their profiles, but I wanted to give the others an opportunity. Now I wanna talk a little bit about uh, photography because uh, this book and all of my books are based on the idea that um, you're going to see an original wartime image of a person, and then you're gonna read about their life story and particularly their civil war story. And um, I think there's a real power in being able to con connect with the face uh, and then find out what happens to that individual. And so it's really, uh, it's, it's very fair to say that the Civil War generation can be also known as the photography generation. Uh, photography was only 22 years old in 1861. 
to give you a, a general sense of uh, the 1839 invention of photography, at the time, Abraham Lincoln was 30, Frederick Douglass was 21, Clara Barton was 18, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was 17, your average Civil War soldier was four, and George Armstrong Custer was all of one. Uh, and I like to think about Custer in particular because he grew up his entire life with photography. And when you consider the way he used photography as part of his public image and his military image, he really understood how to make photography work uh, as part of his own messaging. Some of you who know the history of photography I uh, know this man. Um, if you know one person connected with the history of photography, it is Daguerre. He is the one who built on the work of others uh, who came before him. They were fascinated with phosphorus chemicals. They were interested in the camera obscura that was used by artists. And he invented the first commercially successful pho photography process. Then, about a decade and a half later, another development happens uh, with this man, Desdari. And Desdari comes up with a unique idea, which is um, born out of the necessity of making photographs more of a utility in society. And um, he patents a camera which has multiple lenses as you'll see in this one here, this is a four lens camera. And the idea was pretty simple. A person stands in front of the camera. They basically have four, uh, the four lenses create four exposures on one plate of glass that's covered with chemicals. That plate of glass is developed, paper prints are made, they're cut into four, and then they're pasted to pieces of cardboard. And um, that idea, these baseball card-sized photographs uh, were basically called carts de visite or visiting cards, or they were later Americanized as card photographs. All of this happens in 18, about 1854 is when the carte de visite is patented, but it doesn't really gain traction um, early on. It's really not until about five years later in the spring of 1859 in Paris, where Desdari is from, that uh, the emperor, uh, Napoleon III, and the empress Eugenie walk into a uh, local gallery and have their likenesses produced in the carte de visite format. And of course, because you can print multiple copies off of one glass plate, they circulated these images all around Paris and Folks went wild. Everyone, all of a sudden, wanted to follow the emperor and the empress and have their photographs made in the latest format, the carte de visite. The following summer, a literal repeat happens in London with Victoria and Albert. They sit for their carte de visite, and of course, a craze begins. By this time, it has already landed in America and you start to see ads in newspapers.com uh, popping up during the period of January to March of 1861. So here we are right on the cusp of the Civil War as the storm clouds are gathering. And this new format, the carte de visite, has landed in America. And this whole uh, enthusiasm and excitement becomes known as cardomania. And I'm not making up this term. This is a real word that uh, was used during the Civil War to capture the enthusiasm and the excitement about these images. And uh, the question comes up, why were they so exciting? Um, these are small images. You could hold them in your hands. And they were the kind of images that you would sit in your parlor with your friends. You would comment on them. You would gossip about them. You would look at their faces. You would laugh. You would smile. You could cry. Um, and you could look at your family members. 
You could look at friends from town. Um, you could look at just about anyone through the lens of this camera. And because you could reproduce them, you could have hundreds uh, in your parlor. So uh, three really, really important things to know about the carte de visite is that they're affordable. They're really cheap. Uh, you could buy a dozen for a dollar or a dollar fifty. They're reproducible. If you handed out, if you bought a dozen photographs of yourself and handed them out to your friends, you could then go back to your local photographer who had your glass negative on file and purchase more and give out more. And of course, they're also shareable. You can continue to hand them out to your friends, your family, uh, your comrades during the war. The list goes on and on and on. Another thing about the carte de visite, because they're on paper, you can inscribe them. You, you can In this example, we have some college students who made notes on the back of the image about local societies and committees that they served on. So the idea of personalization is also um, important here because uh, the previous photographic formats, daguerre's daguerreotype, and then the ambrotype, which is basically um, a, a photograph on glass. And then as many of you probably know, the tintype on an iron plate, those three formats are what we collectors call hard plates. Uh, and those hard plates are not quite as easy to personalize. It's harder to write on them. The last word that connects with the carte de visite is democratization. And so the illustration here really says it all. I can get my photograph taken at a local studio, bring my image home, and I can lay it on the table next to Abraham Lincoln or Ulysses S. Grant or whoever I want to. And I can be in the same plane with a famous person. And in America, in particular, where we value democracy, this idea of a republic by the people, uh, this kind of visual power for me to be alongside of the well-known politicians, the famous generals, other celebrities, uh, is the kind of democratization that um, evens out society. And it makes it so you feel like you can accomplish bigger and better things. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, this is the Facebook of the 1860s. It has all the ingredients. Um, the carte de visite is part of a larger mass media uh, revolution that's coming across the country. And um, photo albums, like the one here, um, are born of this need to house all of the cartes de visite that are piling up in households. And so here we have it, uh, photo albums, mass media, social media of the 1860s. How big is the carte de visite? Um, those other formats I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the daguerreotype, the ambrotype, and the tintype, you can see in this chart, the green, the gold, and the blue, those bars are generally fading as those formats are becoming less popular. They're still part of the war and you can still find plenty of images, uh, but they're declining in popularity. The red bar, the carte de visite, or the CDV, as collectors like to say, the red bar, see how that's steadily moving upwards. By 1865, it's the dominant photographic form. In 1861, at the beginning of the war, it's only a small part. So no surprise was all my buildup here uh, that Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great American scientist, man of letters, uh, he says card portraits have become the social currency, the sentimental greenbacks of civilization. To give you a sense of how big the craze was, in England alone, 300 to 400 million carts were sold every year between 1861 and 1867. I did a little bit of math. Um, and if you look at uh, the number of soldiers in the Union Army, two and a half million, and you calculate 
how many posed for a photograph in the beginning of the war, how many posed in the middle of the war, and those who survived, maybe for a last picture at the end of the war. Um, I come up with an estimate of 40 million photographs of the soldiers. This doesn't count for the generals, the politicians, the civilians, only the soldiers alone. 40 million images, I estimate, were produced on the Union side during the Civil War. If only 10% of those images survive, that means that there's 4 million of them out there still today. If you think that's a large number, get your head around this. This is a report that I found, an estimate. Every two minutes, right now, we take, in the next two minutes, we'll take as many photos as the entire total taken in the 19th century. So, four million sounds big, but by the time I finish this presentation, uh, we will have multiplied it numerous, a number of times. So, some of the images they left behind document uh, women during this period of change that I talked about earlier. And so we'll take a look at just a few of those images. Uh, these are a group of women uh, who are exercising. Um, there was a big fad um, right before the war about exercise and women. Here we have a group of milliners uh, who were outside of what I imagine is their shop in Corning, New York. Here's a woman sitting in a chair with her hands crossed. Her name is lost to time. The name of the photographer is not known. A simple but powerful and poignant portrait of two friends. And here's one on the back, this personalization idea. It's simply inscribed 101 years. And she's in her bed with a palm fan. So that's a little bit of a, a background on photography during the Civil War and how important it was to documenting that period of time uh, in a moment when photography was really going through a major technological shift. And today, these cartes de visite um, are really little known and little remembered, but they really captured the, the men and women who lived during the Civil War period. I'm going to take the rest of the presentation to introduce you to some of the women that uh, I researched. Uh, and what you're going to see are a handful of uh, nurses, and um, each of them with original photographs, how they looked during the war. And the stories that I wrote about them are based on um, diaries, they're based on letters, they're based on newspaper reports, and in a number of cases, they're based on pension files. Uh, for those who are formal army nurses, they were allowed to file for pensions after the Civil War and left a paper trail. So let's meet a couple of them. Elmira Fales, uh, she has a long path that starts in before the war from New York to Iowa. Uh, she buries two husbands. She marries a third husband and winds up in Washington, D.C. When her husband gets a government appointment, uh, had the Civil War um, not turned out the way that it had, um, she might have been known for uh, her work as a, as a, uh, as a landlady. Um, she rented out her uh, rooms and her house. And um, one of her boarders uh, in the 1850s was a young Clara Barton. Of course, the war happens. Uh, but even before the war happens, before the war begins, uh, when Abraham Lincoln is elected president, which triggers the southern states to secede, uh, Almira has an interesting reaction. She begins gathering lint to make bandages. This is November of 1860, months before Fort Sumter, and her neighbors think that she's maybe lost, uh, she's off her rocker a little bit here, um, but she's so convinced 
that a great and terrible war is going to happen, she starts making supplies. During the war, she, of course, becomes a nurse. She's indefatigable. Uh, and I love the fact that she's carrying baskets. I found so many references in my research to nurses carrying baskets of goods um, throughout the wards of hospitals and elsewhere. This is a perfect representation, I think, of, uh, of a Civil War nurse. This is just a wonderful portrait. Uh, there's actually three nurses here. Um, Sally Dysart, um, she's the one that's pitched on the left with two of her friends, Annie Bell and Sarah Chamberlain. Uh, Sally, uh, she happens to be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the beginning of the war. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, before the war when Abraham Lincoln is coming through making his inaugural, his trip to his inauguration by train. And um, Sally hears him speak uh, in Harrisburg. And um, her reaction is, quote, all that was good was with him. There was no bad. That feeling and her sense of loyal or her ultimate loyalty to President Lincoln um, encouraged her, prompted her to become a nurse. And she goes on to serve at Gettysburg and in Tennessee. On the other side of the spectrum, um, you've got uh, a veteran community activist, uh, Catherine Lawrence. Um, she is uh, um, fighting for women's rights. She is fighting against slavery. She is fighting uh, against alcohol abuse. Um, she is a force to be reckoned with. When the war comes, she signs up to be a nurse Dorothea Dix, uh, and she butt heads uh, Catherine Lawrence, or Kit as she is known uh, to her friends, uh, is not going to listen to all that um, Dorothea has to say. Dorothea Dix basically sends her to the worst hospitals in Washington, and that sets her up to meet a group of refugee slaves who are fleeing from Northern Virginia. Among those slaves, our three children, sisters, including the one pictured here, Rebecca. And these children are the product of a white master and a slave. And uh, they look more white in features than they do black. And Kit becomes attached to Rebecca and the two sisters. And this launches Kit on a whole new journey um, on behalf of refugees to raise money to support them. And the reason she's pictured with Rebecca. Um, is partly because of her attachment, but also because these images were sold by Kit to make money to support their efforts. Back on again on the other side of the spectrum, here you have young Mary Jo Safford. She finds herself on the battlefield of Belmont, Missouri in November of 1861. And uh, uh, Mary Jo, there's a wonderful description of her. She has made a flag of truce after the battle. There's wounded and injured, wounded men, dying men all over the battlefield. And here she is with a homemade truce flag accompanied by a black man. And they are trying to find the injured men to take care of them. And this begins her legend that grows when she goes to Cairo, Illinois, which is her home base of operations. And she single-handedly gets hospitals started, um, has no experience whatsoever, only the homegrown care that she learned when she was growing up. In this case, she falls a little bit into the category of a freelancer because her brother, her wealthy brother, is funding all of her activities. So she rises to fame uh, in Cairo, and she becomes known as the Cairo Angel for her efforts. Anna Marie Ross uh, is another veteran organizer, similar uh, in some ways to uh, Kit. Only uh, Anna is located in Philadelphia, and she gets involved with the um, uh, the Cooper Shoop, excuse me, Cooper Shop Hospital, and she becomes a person who raises money, helps basically build 
something out of nothing. They're constructing a hospital uh, for sick and wounded Union troops. This is a big effort that takes the better part of a year and a half. And during the course of her efforts, she works herself into exhaustion, falls sick. And on the day that the hospital is dedicated, December 22nd, 1863, while the ribbon is being cut and they're celebrating the opening of the hospital, Anna Marie Ross is on her deathbed and she dies that same day. You met more Mary Morris' husband uh, briefly um, in the beginning of this presentation. She's here with her custom-made apron. Um, imagine her um, perhaps dressed like this on the battlefield of Antietam at the Smoketown Hospital. Um, she has a tent that uh, is set up. It's like a double-wide tent that she shares with one of her sister nurses. She took a piece of red calico and she cut a medicine bottle shape out of that red calico, and she hung it from a flagpole to let soldiers know that this was a place where they could go to get medicine and get care. So Antietam marks the beginning of a journey for her uh, that ultimately ends with her lobbying to President Lincoln to save men who were convicted of various crimes and sentenced to a firing squad. She becomes very active uh, in the effort to petition Lincoln to um, pardon him, and she's very successful. Helen Gilson, you also met her earlier. Uh, she's another person who I think exemplifies the nurse who has a tie to her hometown in Massachusetts. And um, the folks in her hometown are sending supplies to her and she's going back and forth to um, hospitals near battlefields to help first injured folks from her town and sick from her town. But of course this grows to a larger caregiving effort. And the story that she is perhaps, that I remember her best for, is in 1864, um, in P after Petersburg and the series of battles there, a bunch of African-American men from the US colored troops are wounded and sick and they go to uh, get care, but there really isn't a place for them. Uh, the hospitals have become segregated, and these black men in blue are gathered in, in, a, in a wooded area with no one, perhaps, save the regimental surgeon to help them. And Helen says, I'm going to go in there and give them the help that they need. And her sister nurses caution her because they've heard stories, and she ignores all of them. And she says, this is the right thing to do. She goes in there, and she helps these black men get back on their feet. On the southern side, uh, perhaps uh, Felicia Grundy might be the best known of the unknown women um, who participated in the war effort. In fact, there's one quote that says, she's second to no woman in the South. And um, she's in Nashville um, before uh, the, or once the city and the state becomes Confederate, and then after the city falls to Union troops. She's there the entire time, um, raising money, caring for troops. There's paperwork that says she tried to reach out to Richmond to be able to form a Confederate Army nursing program, similar somewhat to what Dorothea Dix did. But again, the resources weren't there. The money was not there, and it never happened. But she did make an effort. Sister Ignatius, uh, I mentioned her as well earlier. And um, uh, as some of you may know, uh, with the Sisters of St. Joseph, uh, the church there, which was used um, by soldiers during the war, there is a lovely quote that she makes that I want to read to you. Um, After a long day of caregiving, the, ho the church has been converted to a hospital and a bunch of her sisters have moved into an ante room. They're exhausted and they need to get some sleep. And Sister Farley opens the door and sees them. And here's what she says, quote, I stood fascinated by the unusual picture of seven sisters worn out from severe hospital duty who were lying asleep on the floor and soldier fashion 
Each sister was enfolded in a blanket, while each weary head was resting upon a pillow made of leaves gathered on the campus. Over the sleeping group, which included the superior, Mother de Chantal, there rested the soft, roseate glow from the sanctuary lamp, gleaming through the glass panels of the closed door, and there was still lingering the delicate fragrance of the incense used in the adjoining chapel during the evening benediction. What a beautiful description, even capturing the, the smell of the church. Sybil Jones, another uh, religious uh, woman, um, Quaker, um, a celebrity. Um, before the war, she and her husband toured around the world on ministry, um, on various ministry trips. Her son, their son, um, makes a decision to become a union officer when the war begins, which goes against the doctrines of the friends. Despite his decision, father, mother, and son correspond during the war until his death in 1864, when Sybil, who up to this time has not been directly involved in the war, she then becomes uh, a nurse. And this, the last woman I'm going to leave you with uh, uh, today is Rosanna Billing. And um, she's described as delicate and frail. Her parents don't want her to join uh, uh, the Corps of Nurses. She does and um, winds up being in the Virginia area, later um, in Annapolis at the Naval School Hospital, caring for Andersonville survivors who are making their way um, to the north. She herself contracts typhoid and dies in January 1865. Her death resonates throughout the nursing community because they know of her goodness and the good deeds that she did. One of the nurses who became aware of her never met her, but became aware of her as a male nurse, and it's a name you know, uh, Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman had this to say, a lady named Miss or Mrs. Billings, who has long been a practical friend of soldiers and a nurse in the army and had become attached to it in a way that no one can realize but him or her who has had the experience, was taken sick early this winter, lingered some time, and finally died in the hospital. Whitman added, it was her request that she should be buried among the soldiers and after the military method. Her coffin was carried to the grave by soldiers with the usual escort, buried, and a salute fired over the grave. This was at Annapolis a few days since. So, thank you so much uh, for listening. And um, I'm happy to take any questions and comments. Uh, I see a message from Carolyn. Um, Ziegler, were nurses required to wear drab uniform collars like brown and black, uh, and we're middle-aged women. Uh, yes, I think what you're, um, what you're noting here is the impact of Dorothea Dix. Um, she was definitely um, called for guidelines that she put out, um, called for drab, unostentatious clothing. Um, she liked the women not to be young. And um, in fact, the age question was a big deal. Um, so many women uh, that applied were often rejected outright just because they weren't old enough. And so, uh, yes, uh, those kind of um, uh, drab collars and age were certainly a, um, a factor for Dorothea Dix. But you'd be surprised how many women who were rejected by, by Dix, and there's a number of them in the book, they refused to take no for an answer. Um, because the nursing um, uh, industry was so unformed, particularly at the start of the war, uh, women just came to Washington anyway, or they went to a battlefield on their own and offered their services, um, or um, some of them pulled strings with uh, their local politicians. So there was a number of workarounds. 
Uh, and the last thing I'll add about Dorothea Dix is she's really important because she um, organizes nurses, women nurses, where no organization existed before. But she also makes a lot of enemies in the process. So her star begins to fall towards the end of the war. And in a way, uh, it's tragic for her uh, because she really should be remembered as an important contributor to American nursing, perhaps more than she already is. Uh, yes, I believe so. If you go to um, uh, any booksellers, this is, uh, is the book available on Kindles. Um, I think there's a, 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 an ebook version available. Um, go to your favorite, uh, wherever you get books, uh, go check it out. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad you have a copy of the book. Uh, you have to let me know what you think. Aaron, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I hope you enjoy this one. Hey, Rick, how are you today? <laughs> Let me put my sound back on. All righty. Great program. Very excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you. Just want to see if anyone else has a question before we let you go. All righty. But if you want to mention again where to get your books and how to get uh, Yes, uh, you can get them um, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere where they carry um, books. You can find it. You can also go to uh, Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, they are the, um, uh, I guess, the official uh, bookstore since they're the publisher. Also, if you're interested in a signed copy, you can go to uh, um, uh, my store. It's uh, called shopmilitaryimages.com. And um, if you use the promo code, I believe it's Lunch with Books, uh, we'll give you a 15% discount on nurses' book and anything else, all my books in the store. And uh, again, those are for signed copies. Here's another question. Uh, great question. Um, I, I don't know the answer uh, uh, to that. Um, I know that uh, Ken Burns and his series did touch on nursing and the medical establishment, but I don't remember all the particulars. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Susan. Oh, Aaron, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, yeah, lots of nice comments and thank yous. And uh, again, very uh, a wonderful program, Ron. Thank you very much. Oh, Sean, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I feel like I'm just the messenger to share these stories. Um, I do hope that you'll uh, get a copy of the book for you or a gift for someone and uh, and learn more about these women. And I, I have to say, as a, as a final note, um, all of the, the release of the book happening in the year 2020, um, I can't help but think of this, this being the year of nurses in so many ways with uh, COVID-19. When I think about all the um, heroic efforts of caregivers this year, um, it does take me back to the nurses of 150 years ago. Uh, and I can imagine they would be doing the same exact thing today that they did from 1861 to 1865. Agreed. Um, yeah. So thanks for that sentiment. And thanks uh, again for the presentation. Next week, Wailing Poetry Series, Aaron Murphy. Thank you for everyone who attended today. And we'll see you the next time. Take care. Thank you all. Bye.